My name is Mike Webb. I'm the Public Engagement Manager here at the Heard Museum. I'm going to go over some housekeeping just a little bit here, uh, make some announcements, and then we'll have the chance to hear from our honored guests, Roshai and Ka, today. Um, so um, this is our continuing series of the Virtual Art Talks. It's our great pleasure to welcome our panelists today, our discussion hosts, Roshai Montano, Assistant Registrar, and artist Ka Falwell, Santa Clara Pueblo Potter. Um, as always, if you enjoy learning about these art forms and the museum's collections, I encourage you to visit the Heard Museum's Billy Jane Bagley Library and Archives. Uh, we do have special summer hours for the archives uh, and library right now, so please check in at herd.org to see those special times. The library is free and open to the public, featuring special summer hours, as said. Uh, it's a fantastic pace to learn more about the artists and works presented in the museum's collection. For our local guests, be sure not to miss our two new exhibitions, uh, Harry Fonseca's Transformation and Art and Soul. Uh, these virtual art talks are made possible thanks to the support we see re receive from our Herd Museum members. Members get many special and exclusive benefits, including free museum admission every day, a 10% discount in the museum shops, which is currently being remodeled, but still open, and, ca and the cafe. Um, invitations to members only events also occur, lectures and exhibition previews. Members also receive discounted event tickets and early admission to both the World Championship Hoop Dance Contest coming up in February and the Heard Museum Guild Indian Fair and Market, which is in March. Join as a member today. You can purchase your membership online, on site, or by calling in. Lots of different ways for that. So before I introduce our program uh, and moderator, just a few housekeeping notes for our viewers. Um, today's presentation is a webinar, and so you'll only see the screens and faces of our presenters. You will not be seen on, on, the, um, on the display, but you will have the opportunity to type into the chat box or the question and answers. If you hover your mouse over the Zoom features where your video and sound are, you'll be able to see that chat box and a little box that says Q&A. If you would like to propose a question for the panel, please write in in these spaces. Uh, we do have time at the end of the uh, our talk to answer those questions. Um, remember, captions are available. If you'd like to use them, again, scroll over your screen in Zoom and turn them on with the menu bar at the bottom. It should say CC. That's how you turn on those captions. Okay, so without any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our honored guests, Ka Falwell and Roshai Montano. Roshai? Hi, thank you, Mike, um, for that introduction. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Rosha Montano, and I am the assistant registrar and co-curator for the exhibition Maria and Modernism. And it is featured in our grand gallery. And I am so honored to be joined today by Ka Falwell. Ka comes from a renowned family from Santa Clara Pueblo embodying the everyday practices of her mother, Polly Rose Falwell, her mother, Jody Falwell, and her aunt, Susan Falwell. Ka received her BFA in studio arts from the Institute of American Indian Arts in 2018. Her work utilizes traditional Pueblo practice that incorporates graphic street art styles, such as graffiti. And you can find her work along with her families featured in Rian Moder Modernism as contemporary, contemporary Pueblo artists who responded and continue to respond to the societal influences and strive for in innovation in their creative practice, just as the matriarchs before them. Um, welcome, Ka. I, I am so happy you're here. I am honored to chat with you today. Thank you, Roshai. I'm so honored to be here with you all, and I really appreciate um, your your work and Mike's work um, to get this all going. So thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, and I guess just to get the conversation started, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, development of the narrative sections in Maria and Modernism. Um, and the section Enduring Influences emphasizes Pueblo innovation and artistic responses to the changing world, which is inherent to Pueblo tradition. And um, that's really important um, uh, idea that we try to follow through in this exhibition. 
and different families, they, they utilize their, you know, um, unique practices and their techniques. And I want to talk a little bit about your family and how you developed your own personal style when the women around you, you know, they're so, um, they're so unique and unique to them. But at the same time, I feel like there is a, a familial style that follows through. Mm. So I'm interested in, in your introductions to Clay and how you found your yourself in the work. Uh, you know, I feel like clay and pottery itself has always been a, uh, I can't even, rem- I, I can't say exactly when I remember like, oh, when did you start working, when did you become a potter or when did you start working with clay? Because it's always just, it's been there. My, some right. of my earliest memories has always been around my grandmother, Jody Falwell's kitchen table where her My Aunt Susan, my mother Polly Rose were always working on their pieces, whether it was processing the clay and they're, you know, standing there um, with the, you know, the sheet on the floor and the raw, raw clay. And they're standing there mixing the clay with their feet, almost like uh, imagine uh, that episode of Lucille Ball and um, Ethel when they're mixing the grapes, but you're just mixing your your temper, your uh, volcanic ash with the raw clay and watching movies. And so it's just, you know, and sitting there almost in diapers, watching them do go through all of the steps and the process of being able to build pottery and to be able to sustain a living. And even though clay may not, or pottery might not be used in a utilitarian way, it's still very much providing for the families Mm -hmm. uh, that are still carrying on Pueblo pottery. Um, I think it's really just, as I get older, I find myself more and more, and lucky is not the right word, but being blessed that I get to um, have this as an avenue to develop my own creativity, but then also be able to provide for my family which I have realized through life that that's not always a guaranteed thing or that's not always a, um, what's the word, uh, guaranteed. It's just, it's very blessed. So carrying on with my work as from a child to an adult now, there's always been a level of, oh goodness, um, Watching, watching my family, watching my grandmother, my aunt and mother. And even at a point in time, there was my great grandmother, Rose Naranjo. Um, and there, I think a really important thing to know about Pueblo pottery is you might, the end product, you might have one, one singular piece and it might have one singular artist's name on it. But when you're looking at each piece, there's almost always a whole family, a whole community behind that one piece. Because when we're digging for our clay, we're digging for the temper, the pot, um, the volcanic ash, when you're just sitting there working, designing, um, doing the fun parts of the pot, um, firing your pottery, it's all very community oriented. It's mm-hmm. all very family based. And it's, I think, I think it's very rare, particularly with Pueblo pottery where you're ever really truly by yourself or sitting there going through all of the steps only by yourself there's always always your family is there with you your community is there and it's um I think that that's a side of Pueblo pottery that's not always recognized when you're looking at the finished product and with Maria in modernism when you see all of her beautiful work and what she represents, there's again, there's all of that family and that community and all of those beautiful stories of other people in, in Santa Defonso Pueblo or even Santa Clara Pueblo or even any of the other Pueblos if they needed to pay for, buy gro- a wagon of groceries or get a wagon fixed or something some of the other they just needed that monetary means um 
and she knew she could get a better price for because her name was attached to that piece she would people would come over and so that's like I think just such a beautiful thing about Pueblo pottery is that there's always this really strong presence of family and community and it's always providing whether it's a utilitarian way holding carrying your water holding your food cooking your food um yeah and it really just carries that that sustenance of life and I think that really follows through in some of the um ideas connected to pottery in the land and carrying that kind of forward even though it's not utilized in the same way and I will say that um it is so important to any visitors who come to the exhibition. I always emphasize that it is um, it is a community activity that the family is involved in so many steps. And there's this notion in like Western art and it's very individualized, but that's not the case with Pueblo mm -hmm. pottery. It's very um, family and community oriented. Um, Mike, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. And so, you know, I, I've, I've loved your work for such a long time and your style has always just stood out to me. And um, can you tell us a little bit about Pueblo swag and how you think this really captures, um, you know, your, your artistic um, style and your practice and what, what um, this, this work kind of uh, has developed into for you? Oh, goodness. So, okay. So, I, like, as a child, I was always seeing my grandmother and aunt and my mom always doing, you utilizing whatever mediums to design their pottery with. And as a child, I was given, you know, it was never any thought, second thought to me about, like, oh, I can't use this medium. I can't use that. I would I mean, I still at times use nail polish on my <laughs> my my pots. Um uh and with my, you know, the current work I'm doing with Pueblo swag, I Charles King is constantly reminding me to like, okay, you have this one style, develop it a bit more, tell that story, and then if you want to move on, you can start transitioning out of it. Because I think I'm constantly like, I want to do this. I want to do that. I have this great idea. And I think I have a time of, like, I have a harder time of focusing and telling the full story at times. And I want to jump to the next story to, you know, to a certain extent. And those Pueblo swag, I was really at the time, um, this is the core, I was working on it. I think I started building it, um, you know, probably 20 2020 I'm a pretty like I'm a very slow builder I also mm -hmm. have like four you know four kids and life happens so I'm building and I'll put it to the side and could be months later till I re-pick it up so I'm pretty sure I built this originally built start building the pot in 2020 mid-pandemic kids were at home having to do online school and kind of figure out a natural like balance of everyone being around but also at the same time I think Pueblo people to, are also very naturally even though it's 2024 we're still in a way like I don't want to say on top of each other but we're still in that rhythm of being with one another nearly every day mm -hmm. um, but it's just finding that balance of the rest of the world and as, a, as I was working on this piece, I was, I remember I had a conversation with Charles, Charles King and he was like, I really want to like start doing something new and different. I feel like I've been doing this for so long. And he's reminding me, but you only produce a certain amount um, of pots a year. And it's just not enough to finish telling the story of mm. this, of this design that you, you've created with the hydro dipping of the pots. And he was, I don't know, just the conversations of being in the Pueblo, wanting, getting antsy. I think it was just that energy of 20, of the pandemic, of getting antsy and wanting things to move and happen. But it's almost in a weird way, was getting very um, 
it's just I don't want to say stagnant but it was just that like same same circle of like what's happening what's going on and I think a lot of the lines within Pueblo Swag represent that to a certain extent Mm -hmm. of wanting to know what's what's going to be the next step what's happening now but then also um trying to find that balance so you have the black and white of course and the Pueblo swag of just I feel like a lot of the times you see a lot of other tribes are very much represented are very very swaggy and they have I mean just their gorgeous beadwork and elk teeth dresses and uh, you know my partner's from Fort Hall Idaho so and I'm out here right now and you just you always see all of their swagged out whether it's day to day going to ceremony or seeing their powwow out here everyone's just constantly swagged out and not to say that Pueblo people aren't but I think in mainstream a mainstream media you see the super swaggy the identifying markers of like that's indigenous that's native american and at times i feel i feel like pueblo people to a certain extent it's also in our nature to be like um very i don't want to say like secretive or hidden in our communities Mm -hmm. but what is for us is for the people in the community and not necessarily the outside world and i think by trying to say pueblo swag with like we like we've got it going on too like we've got (laughs) look at like look at us because a lot of our things we do um the root of our culture base is too about you know it's it's for our people and for the you know the greater good the whole world but it's what's for us is for us and it's there's always a line of like you don't you you are permitted to share only certain things Mm-hmm. to the outside world and that goes back into um Pueblo pottery and my grandmother having to you know when she was coming out with some of the some of her first really wild works in the 70s late 70s 80s and a lot of traditionalists were upset because it was that's not how you present um yourself as a Pueblo person like you're permitted for certain I you can per, you can show and just depict certain iconography iconographic imagery within your work the very you know um I don't want to say stereotypical you know the avenue because I love I love what the avenue represents it's a it's a water bearer it's a water protector um but in traditional work you see a lot of that the avenue that water serpent around the pots and it's heavily based in my work as well but that's one of like some of the few images that can kind of go out there to the world to a certain extent and at the time when my grandmother was doing work it wasn't so much you know um I you know, it was just work that was too out there too out of the box for being for her being a public person and I feel very um again blessed that I don't have to face necessarily that criticism um from the community necessarily um well and I'm sure there is to like a certain extent it's just more acceptable because there's we're so inundated with all kinds of media so what I think is being done is still within pottery and within my particular family with the Falwells it's um I think not seen as bad and I, yeah, I <laughs> and I think uh, you know, like like Rose Naranjo, you know, breaking those boundaries and just being just a radical matriarch and doing what she wanted to do and pushing those boundaries is is you know um, is part of the giving giving reverence towards those women and their fearlessness so Pablo Pablo swag can exist you know and I think think it's amazing and you know if you if 
you give my grandma, for an example, like any opportunity to be swagged out in her like turquoise and her velvets, like she will be out there. So I really like this kind of um, idea of just, uh, you know, with the, the confidence and the, the love and the gratitude towards the idea of Pueblo swag and how you interpret interpreted that. Um, Oh, yeah, no, I, I, you know, again, thinking about working on this piece, there's, and it goes for almost any piece I work on, it's I really just profoundly love the traditional shapes, but specifically the water jars, yeah. um, and having that solid base and that root of um, those shapes that just almost have a really solid foundation within Santa Clara Pueblo within mm -hmm. Pueblo communities that carried the water, carried the food, sustained people for generations and generations and that are still providing for generations. But then I really, I just find it so important as well to reflect who we are as modern, modern day people and what is what we see as keen and cool and just swaggy oh yeah wanting to represent what it is to be a Pueblo person today um and so for a lot that's I mean about any piece of work that's like almost a real foundation of wanting to represent a very that traditional side that really strong those strong roots but then have that sense of again modernism Marian mm -hmm. modernism and what it is to be yeah a just be in the world at this time exactly um i think we have a in process picture just to see what it looks mm -hmm. like with um your uh paint application yeah and i love i always love kind of um how uh, a work takes form over time and sort of the decisions that you make and you know you're really speaking to that foundation of the water jar here but you're also kind of experimenting with some of the the shapes of the body and um I love that it does the, the jar itself tell you what to do or you know do you do you have an idea of how you shape it or does it just take take form naturally you know, um a lot of the time there's sometimes I have I'll get ideas and I'll even do sketches of an idea that I have um and then there's other times I'll just start saying okay I I should just start making something and I'll make something and I'm kind of sit with the shape mm -hmm. or the form of it and I'm like I have no clue what to do with you I have no clue with Pueblo swag that was almost an immediate um just an almost an immediate idea of I wasn't sure how it was going to turn out and I see you know seeing the photographs now I'm like I could say wish I had more time to sit with it I could sit with a pop probably for years on end and playing with the details that no one else is going to see other than myself um and so it, it honestly depends the piece the time whether I have a an idea or not and then even if I do have an idea and I could build build a pot to the shape and idea that I had in mind, the design, for whatever reason, the design just isn't flowing. And there, it goes back to also hearing my grandmother and great-grandmother say, like, you you can't necessarily tell the clay what to do. That's mm -hmm. you, you're just, you, the pot is seen as the vessel, but really you're just the vessel for the pot to come into the mm. world it's not mm. it's really not the other way around you're just getting get forming the clay to what it wants to appear as mm -hmm. um so you know most of the time it's I try to just have that feeling of what what works with the pot and and sometimes I try and push it and push it and it's just does doesn't work and sometimes when you push it your pot ends up breaking and cracking and doesn't make it through the fire and you can almost look back at some of those times and go I was I was trying to push perhaps that idea a little too much for that piece when it wasn't meant to be 
Um, so that's how I work through a lot of my process of designing. It's more of a feeling and a vibe yeah. to go through um, rather than just having a set plan and idea. Yeah, that makes total sense. I've worked with clay and it's so, it's really hard to understand what it wants and what it needs to do and sometimes it just falls apart and you have to start over and it's an incredibly patient um, process you have to have a lot of patience and it takes a lot of time um, and you know speaking of, of that I mean starting at the beginning um, you you mentioned that working in clay is is more than a hobby it's a way of life you've um, kind of alluded to that and um, I'm I you sent me some really wonderful pictures of your of your family um, working through this process and and starting at the beginning so could you tell us a little bit about what that process is like <laughs> and um, is it joyful or is it just completely like laborious Oh gosh. Okay. So probably de depends the time, the day, the year, what age you're at. So the pictures here we have um, of the Santa Clara clay pits. And this is the same clay pits that at basically any and all Santa Clara potter gets their clay from. So whether you're looking at contemporary, contemporary Pueblo potters, like my grandmother, my aunt, my mother, um, they get we get our clay from here you could be looking at very traditional traditional families um such as margaret tafoya got her clay from the same clay pit um her margaret's daughter luann and grandson daryl and her you know her grandchildren uh, um, and great grandchildren. So you look at the young bloods of mm. Nancy and her sons and Nathan. They all get their clay from the same clay pit. So you have this this very spot is really um, laid the foundation for some unbelievably like prolific Pueblo potters and hearing stories of my of my grandmother Jody Falwell of her talking about her mother Rose and how even my great grandmother would take pots to go sell to Maria at well she was a young lady and hearing great 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 grandmothers you know also digging Marie they would go on trips to go dig clay at the same clay pit um which is really like to to think about to say Maria Martinez and Margaret Tafoya, two very prolific women in pottery, that they that they were at the same clay pit doing the same thing at different points in time, and that generations are still doing the same thing, and hopefully, and I will say, I'll put that out in the future, will be doing it in Absolutely. how many generations from now on. Um, and digging clay, it's, you go into it and you're with your family. And as a small kid, it's 100% labor laborious. You're so bored. It's hot. You want to go home and, you know, go watch TV, go do something fun. You're, you know, have to get up early in the morning to be the summer heat or the spring heat. And you want to get your tail out of there. And then at times... You're, you could even be an adult and go, shoot, I, I got to get some clay ready. I got to get ready for either I got to get ready for the herd market or Indian market. And I got to get I got to get at least the bucket together. But it's always you're always with your family mm -hmm. at some point. Someone's always going, I'll go with you. I'll come and help or I need to get some, too. And so if you see here the larger photo um on the screen I believe to the right um is the in the middle is my grandmother Jody to the, her right is my mother Polly Rose and to the left in the black shirt is my aunt Susan and you can see my mom handing my grandmother going look I found a really good piece and I remember this day was um a they have to they come uh 
I want to say an ex excavator or something that helps like pull out like the sand and the dirt to get under the shelf of clay. Oh, okay. And so at this point, I remember this day we were kind of saying, okay, they haven't um, brought in their excavator, their machinery to help mm -hmm. pull back the dirt and the sand to go farther in. And you will find the the clay in there. Um, and it's almost like a very rich, and when you pull it from the ground, it's very cool and silky and lush and comes out when you find really good, really nice big chunks. And it almost very much looks like chocolate, like a mi mixture of not necessarily dark or milk char chocolate. It's like that in between, but it's a silky and just straight from the earth. And it's has the most pleasant earth smell that's just so fresh very close to what you know the rain smells like very close yeah um and so you know we're sifting at this point they're really sifting through the clay and there's areas where it looks like oh that's clay and then you start seeing the silt the sand um and we try and get of course the most the most pure parts um possible um so that's kind of what was going on here. And I think to the bottom left corner with the little orange shovel is my partner. And at the time I was pregnant with my um, my oldest daughter. And I don't see my son, but I know he was around here. So there was, probably, there was four generations of potters here. So my grandmother, my mother and aunt and myself and my children. So that's, I think, a really, really profound. I don't know if profound is the right word, but um, really good example of how pots come to be and where that community starts in. Yeah, you can really see um, multiple generations, you know, they have their own uh, task at hand, but working to collectively. And I really love that picture and see all of that um, memories being made in, in your images. Yes. So the photo we have here is again of my grandmother and my aunt and we were doing a demonstration, firing demonstration after I think it was like a weekend long um, uh, pottery demonstration building and the students got to make, make their own pots and go along with the firing process and we have on the tarps um, I believe that is a lot of manure I had mm. to go retrieve. They realized they had forgot um, the all of the cow manure for for the firing process so the night before my mom and I had to go back to Santa Clara and we're scavenging for our, the cow manure um in Santa Clara just where some of the cattle or can uh what is it uh freely range and graze through <laughs> the juniper and the sagebrush and you want really dry patties and dry manure um just for just better effects and less smoking and the moisture if you have too wet of a patty can that moisture within it can crack your pot and oh my gosh. you know blow up your pot which would be no good so um next yeah this pot please. yeah let's go to the next slide oh here we go okay so i think this one is where they're about to put the pieces in um Alan, oh, there we go. Yep. Um, and so there. for this process, do you, I saw in the previous image that the pots are kind of surrounding the fire. Does that mm -hmm. have any necessity, like bringing it up to temperature without being directly in the fire? Yes. And I think what was going on was this day was like just slightly breezy. And my grandmother was worried about when fine, traditional firing, we're I think with being a contemporary Pueblo artist, we we do fire with a kiln a mm -hmm. good portion of the time. Um, and we also do like a mixture of kiln firing and then what I guess you would call a raku firing of smoking our pots to also achieve the black polish. So mm -hmm. we'll do like, it's almost sometimes like a hybrid of contemporary firing in a kiln, like a ceramicist, but then also trying to pull out the pot and do to get to achieve the tra at times traditional look so sometimes it can be a 50 50 of contemporary and 
traditional firing. So this is like this particular way of firing. Um, I know what the pots around it was to sh just temp yeah, pull up the pots, just help dry, make sure that dried up, help warm them up from that breeze so that there was less chance of breakage. Um, and with here, this is like this particular method just shows a very rough and rugged version of firing. I think of, um, you know, the pots that were being built were micaceous pots. So micaceous clay, for whatever reason, is uh, it's a more elastic than Santa Clara clay. Mm -hmm. It has a little bit more give and pull to it. It's more flexible. And so it, that's also why I think a lot of bubble potters chose to use uh, micaceous clay for their utilitarian uh, cookware and water collecting. And with the pots, I I do remember for this particular demonstration, I remember someone asking, I've seen, um, saying, I've seen some other potters where they have um, the wood, you know, the beautiful cedar wood, they beautifully stack up their pots and they have the right. metal, um, what do you call it? Work, um, metal uh, milk work crates. Mm. Uh, to help protect the pots, and I um, remember I remember hearing my grandmother and aunt saying, "You want that, especially when you put in how many hours of work of particular to protect your pot from the uh, wood falling in or ash when it's so highly polished and it's ex you know just beautifully deep carved. So you want yeah you want to protect your pots, but they were like we're making." We're making some serious pots here. You guys are going uh -huh. to be using these. We're going super old school. Um, so that's kind of what we have here. So there's, again, within firing, there's different methods and ways to fire pots traditionally and mm -hmm. contemporary. So just, I think, depends on the time, the pot. Yeah. Um, so uh, just speaking uh, briefly about your 20 well, 2020 or 2019, 2020 body of work, I absolutely, um, you know, love this natural palette of grays, browns and whites. And to me, it kind of is reminiscent of the natural striations and rocks and land and water. And I love kind of that, that technique that you utilized for that, as well as, you know, um, the, the sculptural form of the vessel and of course the Avanu um, with its sharp graphic lines emphasizes the I guess dynamic movement of 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 the of the serpent and um, I I'm interested in in sort of the techniques that you chose um, to create this body of work you you briefly mentioned it um in a previous slide i think you called it um like hydro dipping yes so i oh goodness um just scrolling through social media and seeing this was years and years ago i want to say like circa like 20 not like 2009 2010 and when youtube was kind of still it was youtube but still not YouTube as we know is still very that like homemade people just filming with their phones or digital cameras and lighting wasn't involved and people were just getting the concept of like showing DIYs at home and I remember coming across um women just the thing of hydro dipping your nails where you drop nail polish into a cup of water and then you dip your finger your fingernail into the cup and it sticks and I was like, oh, that's really cool. That's me. And then I saw, came across the algorithm, started pulling up more of this, like hydro dipping your fingernails. Then it started pulling up people hydro dipping coffee mugs and they would go to Walmart and just buy, you know, your generic white coffee cup and dip it in nail polish or whatever else. And just to get like a cool look just for a fun crafts idea. I was like, well, that's interesting. So, like, okay, yeah, uh, coffee cups are, you know, glazed and smooth. And, but if that can, if that works for the coffee cup, and eventually, yeah, if it's just nail polish with that smooth surface, it's going to, that nail polish doesn't have any base to hang on to. 
And I started thinking, I was like, well, what about pottery? Pottery is ceramic, it's clay. It's why can't I do that as well? And I started playing around with, okay, let me try. And I'd make like little tiles and little pots um, just to play around with. And I have like a weird little collection of broken shards here and there still of some of those first pieces of dipping it in nail polish and going, oh my gosh, this is sticking. This is working. Weird. Cool. I really like these textures. Um, and then as time progressed, you know, um, playing with nail polish and acrylic enamels to see like what floats at the top of the water. So hydro dipping, when you dip it, you get a bucket water and a type of paint enamel that I guess has to sit at the, mm -hmm. be able to sit at the top of the water. With acrylic, I noticed just plain acrylic just kind of sinks to the bottom and turns the water, whatever mur murky color it is, right? just waters down the color. So that doesn't just regular acrylic work, does not work. Oil does not work. Oil paints don't work either. Spray paint, nail polish, acrylic enamel. And now they like have come out with, oh goodness, it's just kind of called, it's just an enamel um, that you can dip almost anything in but with uh -huh. these pieces it's actually uh spray paint so it's hydro dipped spray paint so the spray the spray paint into the water um, on top of the water and then what you can do is to achieve that marbling effect is by um, just spraying that spray paint on top of each other and you kind of have to work a little fast like once you once you do it that's it that's for the most part it that's what you get so you kind of almost have to have a planned idea of how are you going to hold it? What parts of the pot do you want dipped? Um, so with the hydro dipping, that's a lot of the process and all kind of depends. Um, I, with these two pieces, this was like a small body of work that I did for Charles King um, in that 20, in the pandemic era. Um, and I haven't actually used this exact same method Um since then with the spray paint it's been more so of the acrylic acrylic enamel nail polish and hydro hydro dip paints to use I've come to find out that I personally really like my pots to have a certain breathing room especially mm -hmm. when it has um a lot of a lot of the the hydro dipping in it I, I need some of that that clay color to come through to breathe um if not feels very somewhat congested and stuffy yeah so that's where a lot of the sorry a lot of the earth tones kind of come come through from yeah I really I love that balance I do feel like those colors are just so beautifully complement each other and um I like that you said it leaves space I I I, I feel that in your work um I think we'll go to the next one just so we have enough time to talk about okay. the graffiti of Anya Jar in Maria yeah. modernism yeah I, so the go, go I'm ahead I'm sorry go ahead Roshai go oh. ahead <laughs> all right so this the graffiti in Avenue Jar was one of the more goodness how do you say um one of the closer to first pieces of actually really hydro dipping the pots and figuring out what works for just the material, the the medium of hydro dipping itself and the pot and trying to find that balance of letting the clay breathe. I look at mm -hmm. it now and I'm like, oh my gosh, oh like I ooh. you know, I <laughs> I can see how this this the other previous pictures of pots, um, those were the predecessors to mm -hmm. graffiti and avenue jar. And I was really trying to get pull out more natural tones, as you can see with this this avenue. And it just wasn't like, of course, it's more of a like coming up very peachy. I don't remember it being that peachy, but I was looking to try and find a earth tone, get to a closer earth tone of the actual mm -hmm. pot. And when I was painting this, I had realized I had sanded the pot a little too finely because my original intention was to polish it to traditionally polish it and so I had sanded it to just nearly its most smoothest possible point without thinking of like I need 
you know, without thinking, okay, what's going to be my black backup plan if I don't polish it? For whatever reason, I chose to hydro dip it. And I want to say this actually might have been the first hydro dipped pot I did that I actually put out to the public that's not in my own personal mm. um, closet of weird you know experiments so I think this was actually the very first pot within the style that I released um, and you can see on the avenue itself there's parts where it looks like the paint was like chip like peeling and chipping Mm -hmm. which at first which was actually happening to the paint it started coming off and it's going oh shoot like what am I going to do like I don't want to have to resend all of this and redo all this work again and looking at it more and when you sit with your pot sometimes for so long you're just like what am I doing this is like oh my gosh I'm a fraud I'm an amateur like this is <laughs> terrible like who who's gonna want this um and just looking at it and thinking this it feels so stuffy it feels too tight and I don't know whatever reason I don't know if I may now made the right choice to leave those spots you know yeah of the natural clay showing but I felt like I wanted more to the left side picture where the neck of the pot is and you can see how you see the actual clay coming out I think mm -hmm. that's what I was trying to do was try to mimic that onto the avenue um and I don't know, it, I guess it works. It is what it is. Um, but this this piece is particularly special because it is that in the series of whatever this particular style is of mine. I don't think I have a name for it um, other than my hydro dipped pot. <laughs> is, this, was the, this was the first one and I was unbelievably honored for it to be included with alongside maria's work and all these other really renowned amazing Pablo potters um i look at this piece and i'm just like it, it's what you know something that was very a very experimental piece uh and i look at it i'm like i don't still don't know should i have really released it but for it to be within the style of mine to be picked I really for love, such um a i love beautiful the exhibit I love the layers of experimentation here because for the viewers that can't see, the jar isn't completely like round underneath either. There's kind of some corners to it. And then there's like that um, kind of undulating nodules on the neck too. It feels like that there's a lot of energy kind of almost erupting from the surface. At least that's how I kind of like um, uh, how it speaks to me. And then of course the graffiti um, and we are so honored to have this piece in the exhibition. It's definitely one of my favorite um, of yours of all time. Thank uh, you. Thank you. So I, I love the graffiti application. I think it really surprises people in a really good way every time they come across it or I'm in the gallery. And um, it's not completely obvious just because of stylized graffiti exactly mm -hmm. what it is. And so you kind of have to... Um, spend some time with it and I and I love that about this work oh thank you it's a very it's a very special piece and it's again was so experimental to begin with and I think because I'm just I'm as the artist again artists are always so hypercritical of their own work there's a part of me that I'm just like oh my gosh I really that's out there in the world and I can't believe oh my gosh but then another part I'm so I look at it with great fondness and memories and your pieces almost are in a weird way like markers you look at a piece and you almost remember where you were at in that time of your life um and almost like they're little relatives or you know distant relatives you know like just little relatives that you see that you haven't seen in a while and you're like I haven't seen you in forever it's so good to see you <laughs> um so it's just again that like again balance of being hypercritical of my own work but then also being so happy to see it and how it came along and just from the beginning of building this piece it was it was all experimental using a square cereal bowl that I think came from Walmart or grocery, you know, the grocery yeah. store 
and going, oh, that would, I, I'm pretty sure I saw my aunt and grandmother use it and going, that's really cool. I had cool. Let me try that. And, you know, realizing, okay, square using um, a square pookie is, has its own challenges to mm. start the vessel. And my grandmother, if you, um, anyone's familiar with my grandmother's work with her, she has the pieces out there that lean more on like what's considered her traditional work um, mm -hmm. of, she calls them her nipple pots. And I've always thought they were so beautiful. Um, to have um I just in a weird way con very contemporary to see her nipple nipple pots and so again with the little nodules on there the nipples very experimental to put them on there for me as well I love that so, thank you so thank you for I I really appreciate it Roshai for your appreciation of the piece and here it is yes this was in, in process. process yes of that very piece and this is a current piece I'm actually currently working on. It's still home in New Mexico, sitting in the Pueblo right now, um, still working on either towards market or you'll find it at Charles King's gallery, one or the other. Um, so we'll see. We'll see it in the yeah. future. Yes. So it'll be out there that. in the ether very soon. Perfect. And um, I guess I just want to end with the last slide, Mike, if you could turn to that um, very briefly. Uh, I know that we started sort of with um, this idea of the kitchen table. You you mentioned that and um, the importance of of having all generations of family in involved in the process. And this is your son and your grandmother together working and um, I just wanted to quickly ask how you, uh, how you've developed your artistry as a mother and to, um, teach your children some of the important skills and lessons that, um, you know, pottery can give. You know, it's interesting because I still feel like I, I want them to just have that foundation, whether they choose to be artists themselves whether they choose to be potters themselves or they choose to just go off and do a whole other career out there in the world um I think is just such a valuable um skill for them to have I mean apocalypse could happen never know they could still they they can learn to okay we can at least build some some pots and know how we need to get our clay to stick together to fire you know in case we need to you know go back to utilitarian times and you know so but then the other side of if they have this skill it's uh, it's really based in um all those previous gener like previous generations even before my grandmother of having to have this skill just to, just to survive just day to day and I don't think there was any too much thought of it being we have to do this or thank goodness we can do this. It was just so intertwined within the culture. Mm -hmm. I think that that's what I want my children to know that this is a really, really strong pillar for our family, for our culture, for the community we come from, and whether they choose to take that and carry it. I think they, I, I, I feel confident as an adult now that whatever they choose to do, they will, these lessons that, play brings into your life it'll it, they'll carry it on to different aspects of having to follow through each step um and you can get experimental and have fun but there's also you have to stay within those bounds to get that final product to mm -hmm. being able to stand up and thrive and be out there in the world and um yeah and it's just that opportunity for those memories for my children to see their great grandmother working who she's so amazing and prolific in her own work and um just that spunk she had to just it's just so ingrained in her dna like oh you told you know the people who told her oh you shouldn't do that and you couldn't do that um with pottery mm -hmm. that i don't know just something 
again for them to take with them as they grow and me myself it's I never realized also the work to carry on to the effort you have to put in as an an adult as a parent to teach your children these lessons it's a lot of work and effort so I'm learning too um along the way of having to keep up that responsibility which it very much is wonderful being while teaching it's it's an ongoing process and uh, I just want to thank you so much for your time and sharing your work and these stories and memories with us Um, I think we have time for maybe a question or two so I would love to open it up for any anyone out there who um, wants to ask a question so Um, if, uh, yes. well, while we get any questions in the chat, I can ask you something that I was interested about. Okay. Yeah. Um, while you're gathering clay, I was wondering how you, um, kind of maintain the land and the intentionality for the families who also gather there. Cause you said there's just so much history and families continue to gather um, in the same area and um, and so I I was wondering if there were um, any lessons that um, you were taught just just about that that work um I you know because we're taking from the earth and we're we're taking something borrowing we're not I don't want to say taking but borrowing and using something that's supposed to be a gift you know there's always just that like traditional practice of leaving an offering back to back to the clay whether that be you know a little bit of candy or um tobacco or even coffee or even you forget to grab any of those things that you can leave as an offering corn you know the cornmeal um that we have that although people use to pray with it's um you, whatever you have on hand as an offering or just that like that very intentional side of you to just say thank you whether that's out loud or in your mind to just mm-hmm. say thank you but it's always I think it's always um a nice thing I've always seen my mom or grandmother you know um if we have our little breakfast sandwiches or whatever just leave a little piece off to the side for that that thanks of where it comes from and then to you know of course we try and you know after our snacks and stuff try and haul back all our trash and clean up and unfortunately because people are human and we live in this really chaotic time in life that's mixed with um modernism and being human you know of course we come across trash and sometimes have to pick up unnecessarily and you know just the human side of things there's um sometimes you can show up to the clay pits really pleased it's beautiful and it's really great pickings and other times you can be like oh my gosh wow this was who left this year and why are they doing like you know just that disappointment but it's again that balance of of humanity and the community and trying to just figure it all figured it out as a public person a modern one (laughs) of course um mike do we have time for loretta's question yeah let's go ahead and ask uh the question in the chat posed to us is your graffiti something you've seen or something you've invented or maybe both um no definitely i don't think the graffiti (laughs) i invented i'd like to claim i did but no i seeing being a millennial and growing up in you know my youth so to say my teen years was those early to mid 2000s and seeing just being interested in pop culture and seeing things that were imagery as a teen person I remember was just the graffiti work street work was really interesting to me and I hadn't seen it applied to Pueblo Pottery and it was Probably seeing graffiti and street work in itself was one of the main main pillars of me going, I 
think I want to carry on work, working, using bubble pottery, using pottery as my foundational skill to depict this type of imagery to a certain extent. And by no means am I a graffiti artist at all. I don't even, I, you know, I don't, once upon a time, I'm, would probably I would have probably been like yeah okay we'll tag up or whatever and do all this stuff you know (laughs) like trying to be a rebellious kid but at this point like I'm not like I want to I I really again I want to care depict something that's of this time and age from my from my generation that is seen as I guess what or what was seen as a youthful art form in a way um but something that was traditional because you look at again maria's pieces today and they're seen very very traditionalist but back in the day they were unbelievably pushing the bounds with Mm -hmm. the the gunmetal polish and some of those very clean art deco geometric designs um you know the 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 monochrome uh black and the uh monochrome monochrome or polychrome am i thinking of someone correct me polychrome Um, yeah uh uh just those yeah art deco inspired so again something that was seen contemporary is very seen very traditional now and who knows maybe from 80 years my pieces are still standing (laughs) like they'll be like oh old old ancient you know pieces so and I I grew up in Albuquerque New Mexico and street art and different types of public art was incredibly inspiring to me and it's accessible and it's cool and it's um you know unique to the individual and it's it's uh really great to see that applied to a jar and it's nothing I've like ever seen before Yes, you know, I try and it's something, yeah, I, and that was also a thing too. I, I wanted to do something that, that was different and had, that wasn't seen that hasn't been played with yet. So hopefully I can carry on and keep surprising and doing new things, but also have that sense of you look at it and you see, you see a Pueblo pot. You know, if you know what full pottery is, you can you can see it, but then also have that sense of modernism. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really loved our conversation. And for those of you who are still watching, please visit Maria in Modernism. It closes on July 28th. Um, there's still a week and a half please join us and you can see Ka's beautiful work as, as well as her grandmothers, uh, Jody and Susan. And Susan, uh, I hope to see you there. And um, I hope everybody enjoyed this program. Thank you, Roshai. Thank you, Ka.